Welcome everyone tonight for our Ergonauts Mission Control. It'll be a town hall forum uh, slash discussion with uh, Mr. Keith White uh, going over uh, vibrations as an ergonomic risk factor. Again, I want to thank all the uh, panelists and participants for being here and joining us. Uh, starting off with uh, rules of engagement, again, this is going to be more of a discussion, kind of people will be asking questions. If you're a participant, uh, participating as a panelist, uh, you can say those questions out loud. We'll give people a chance to uh, ask those and answer them. And then if you are an attendee, you can put those in the chat and I'll go ahead and ask them for you to Mr. Keith White, and he will gladly um, answer them or work together with the panelists to answer them for you. <clears throat> And so a uh, little bit about Mr. Keith White. Um, Steve, if you want to go over that. Yeah, I'd be glad to. Yeah. Uh, Keith is a, uh, well, we should be calling him Dr. Y, but he pretty much insists on being called Keith. He, uh, he doesn't have a huge ego, but he, uh, if anybody deserves it, that'd be Keith. He's, I've known, a, <laughs> I know a lot of, uh, a lot of ergonomists and been in the business for quite a while. And Keith is probably the sharpest as guy you you ever meet, you know. And so uh, the uh, when we reached out, one of the one of the issues that we see today is people from an ergonomics perspective they don't get a formal training on uh, vibration and the problems with vibration, what it is, where you see it. Uh, so I, uh, when we were talking about the things that make a well-rounded ergonomist, Keith was the person that uh, came to mind. So he was gracious enough to 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 put together and and set up as our uh, as our uh, technically our our main presenter. Uh, but we we really have a, a great group uh, to compliment Keith tonight. We got Albert Moore, who's a certified professional ergonomist. He's also a, uh, a world recognized. Um, um, researcher and so he's got both the practical experience and and then he's you know he's published um, he's uh, and and I'm glad to call uh, both these both these folks my friend we've got our CEO tonight uh, Nicole she uh, she said she this comes sliding in and uh, Nicole Case she runs a company and uh, she uh, she does a great job and um, we're fortunate to to have her uh, then we have Matt um gooch who is a vice president for superfeet uh matt is uh he just did a brilliant presentation for us we in the aftermath of presentation he mentioned vibration and i was you know begging matt on to be one of our uh one of our um executive panel members as well so uh, we got matt and then we got dr greg pitts greg deals with a lot of what happens when uh when the continuous use of vibration uh, Greg's also an ergonomist. He's uh, he's been uh, he's has multiple clinics uh, for occupational therapy and physical therapy. But he also he's been a partner with Toyota for uh, over twenty years. And so he uh, uh, we we really have a, a a great crowd. And and what we want is questions because we've got the the right people, uh, whether it be a panelist or or Keith himself. And so uh, I'm going to go ahead and. Uh, turn it over to Keith. Uh, and uh, I know that, that Ray may have a couple of other things, but, uh, and then we have Ray. Uh, Ray is our uh, mission controller. Ray's an air, he's a, actually an active pilot in the United States Air Force. He's a graduate of the Air Force Academy. He's an engineer as well. So uh, we have, uh, we've got good representation from, from lots of area. And that, that's pretty much all I have, uh, Ray. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. Uh, yeah, so we'll, now we'll go ahead and hand it over to Dr. White, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing the screen. It'll just be all faces today, uh, mm -hmm. mostly uh, discussion-based. So go ahead. And all right. Well, you're going to challenge me to see if I can share. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, we, can, we, can all, we can all see you. But if, oh, there we go. I see your next. Perfect. Well, welcome to the uh, discussion. Uh, what I'd like to do is use pretty much just this flow to guide 
of the discussion. I'm going to try to move it up just a little bit more if I can. I may not be able to. Um, you know, first of all, what is it? How is it transmitted? What does it cause in the body? And then what are approaches that we can do to, to help reduce the effect? Uh, with that, you know, looking at what is vibration, what does it affect? Uh, what are the diseases? One of the first things I always go to is my AMA guides to the evaluation of disease and injury causation and really look at it from a, a medical perspective. With that, the very first line relates that it's a multifactorial issue. When we talk about a vibration, there is a lot going on. And one of the biggest challenges isolating to just the vibration at hand. And that's very difficult. You know, so in essence, if you had something that's uh, moving and you only touch it, can you measure that effect? Well, I don't, that's not very practical because we use tools, we're in environments that are dynamic. So there may be an acute effect, you know, a loading such as being on a forklift, you know, is it the vibration or is it the terrain that you're covering on the forklift and you're hitting bumps, uh, holes in the road? You know, is that the issue? Techniques, uh, you know, using a chainsaw, is it the vibration or is it the, the tension that somebody would have trying to use the, the chainsaw that's the issue? Cold, the environment of use plays a factor. Mm -hmm. And even just personal factors. You know, one's, one's ability to be able to absorb the vibration or approach it in a, in a meaningful way where it's not an issue. So for the panel then, what's your comment on just vibration in general? What does it mean? Well, I, I don't know. I'd like to, this is kind of like a heavy topic and has a lot of injury things, but I was thinking of the good things of, of the vibration. Like when you're sitting down at your keyboard, and you are creating your sound and your your the strings are vibrating on on the piano and you have your you're doing your pedaling and your and the and the way you're interacting with the with the keys the gato staccato you're creating this image of sound that's that uh is is expressive and can be a good good use of the vibration to communicate with so that's that's a positive thing but i think we're going to spend a lot of time though on the the parts that when it's excessive, because the keyboard, that's not usually excessive for people. But what what, we, what you're going to talk about is like how it can really, really damage damage people and how we need to prevent that. Well, and, and even just to that point, one of the last points I was going to make is the research being done on whole body vibration as a good thing, as more of an exercise, you know, and building up tissues, not destroying tissue. Hmm. Hmm. Look forward to that, Keith. It's it's uh it's odd the uh, the conversation since you know I've I've been talking it up and talking to a bunch of people and and the the thing that comes flying out of most people's mouth is okay when I use a weed eater and I set that weed eater down my hands mm -hmm. continue to vibrate for two hours <laughs> uh, and uh, you know they're uh, different uh there was somebody who was talking about a uh a construction a tamper you know because a tamper sets there and runs you know absolutely runs. yeah so you know i think that's where you know we see most of the people i see it on the construction side um you know do you pay 25 dollars more for that balance tool and uh you know then to sit there and run you know all day and, and and transmit that and people really i don't think understand what's happening inside it, what the mechanism is for that to to cause that effect so 
that I don't know. I don't know if that helps, but I'll tell you when I when I run about uh, when I run a uh, weed eater for an hour. You know, I, I when I turn it loose, if once I get my hands loose, you know, then my hands continue to you know to shake. And you know, how's that? What is that mechanism that's doing that? So, yeah, I've, I've felt it as well. Uh, one summer in school, I ran a jackhammer and a and a tamper, and that wow. was. <laughs> but a lot of that, even with the you know vibration of being multifactorial, is once the once the guys that really knew how to run it showed me their technique, it was more of your guiding it mm -hmm. instead of trying to. So you're you're even somewhat with what Albert was saying, you're dancing with it as opposed mm -hmm. to being in in control and fighting it. So there's a lot of technique involved in whether or not that vibration is going to be a, an effect, a negative effect to you. And I, I would bet too, Steve, if you got done weed eating after an hour, that grip strength didn't feel quite the same either, right? Oh. So not only did you feel that kind of continuous resonant feeling of, uh, but fatigue, right? If you tried to then pick up something you wouldn't have that same control and grip strength. And I think right. there's so much vibration in our everyday lives, like Albert was alluding to, that we don't even really think about the fact that we're talking and hearing each other is primarily a factor of vibration in our ears, right? So right. the ability for vibration to be a good thing and potentially a negative thing, like so many other things in our life is like too much of a good thing can have a, a lot of unintended consequences to a degree. Right. Um, and because of the amazing mechanism that our body has of being able to have an overlap with the natural frequencies of vibration that are created by so many different things that we do, um, that our soft tissue in particular has natural resonant frequencies that overlap with the frequencies that are created by so many things, not the least of which um, uh, happens from impacting the ground when we walk and run. Um, having that overlap uh, in our soft tissue allows our bodies to more effectively attenuate impact forces just from movement and doing those things. We have that same type of overlap uh, in all sorts of soft tissues all throughout our body, certainly not limited to the lower extremity. So it is, uh, to me, when I think of vibration, I think of both a good thing uh, and potentially uh, the accumulation of, of something that leads to uh, fatigue and injury so often um, that people aren't always aware of or or think about. Yeah, Matt, and I think that's a very good point about the fatigue. You know, and even as as Steve talks about, you know, is our goal as a ergonomist is it just to reduce injuries? Well, I'd like to. I like to think about ergonomics. You know, and with the ergonomics, you know, my goal is to ensure each person is physically able to do the job that they're being asked to do before the injury. So fatigue comes into, you know, how do you how do you reduce that fatigue factor? Because as the fatigue increases, your output and at least and the quality of your output tends to decrease. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about the injury. Yeah, keep, keep Let's, uh, I like how Keith, you, you've identified the multifactorial problem with mechanical, mechanical only, which could be anything from soft tissue injury, tears, whatever, uh, acutely uh, injuries that could be acute to the nerve, techniques, environment, and personal risk factors. You know, it, it kind of lends the fact it's hard to, to describe the dose relationship and, and make it direct connect to injury. We all know it impacts injury but my experience has been that when you apply duration with vibration environmental cold with technique and poor awkward postures and then personal risk factors of diabetes or whatever you really see a really big impact and so i think this multi-factual problem is 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 really important to think about big picture but it makes it hard to determine the dose relationship of injury. Absolutely. You know, that that then can factor into how you approach the issue and trying to eliminate, you know, which which is the most critical to eliminate 
or do you go after a little bit of each one? Mm-hmm. So, so with vibration, go ahead, Steve. No, I, Keith, I was, I was going to ask, you know, to get you to explain what is the mechanism? How, number one, how's it being created by something The purely the, the vibration, the amplitude and, you know, how does that happen? And then you, you mentioned it, you know, the, the transmission, but, uh, you know, from, I'm a visual thinker. So, you know, when, when we look at what is vibration, what, you know, what is it, um, you know, what, what's that tool doing to what, how, what's it doing and how's it being transmitted into my body? Well, uh, well, let's look at the, the body part and where it's transmitted. Mm-hmm. So, Everything vibrates. If it doesn't uh, vibrate, it's really, really, really cold. (laughs) And it can vibrate in, uh, you know, different axes, the X, Y, Z axes, depending on what it is, Mm -hmm. then it gets transmitted into the body in different, you know, different ways. One of the first transmission points when you think about vibration is the whole body vibration. So that's primarily either through the foot or through the your buttocks, you know, through the foot standing on surfaces. Um, you know, did a bit a little bit of looking into uh, dampening uh, people that are riding, you know, for military purposes in boats. You know, so they're skimming across the water and there's a lot of vibration being transmitted. They're having to stand up to see where they're going and to get to the objective and stuff. What do you do about that? Well, an idea there is you're not going to really affect the environment. So how do you decrease that transmission of all those all those jarring forces to the body? You know, but even with that, you're able to, with the body part from a technique, relax a little bit and absorb some of the vibration. So mechanically, anything that moves has the opportunity to increase, uh, to increase vibration or miniature forces on the body. You know, as an engine spins, it's vibrating. Uh, as you use it, use your weed eater, then you're getting into different positions. The rotating head is going to create a different torque, different direction of that vibration. Uh, so I wanted to keep it, keep it simple. And just basically anything that moves can be, creates uh, forces, repeating forces uh, that can be absorbed in the body or affect in the body mm-hmm. yeah and you know i'll tell you the uh you know if you look at it from you know keeping a simple perspective you know i i do a lot of work in construction and you know we vibe concrete so when concrete shows up you've got to have a vibrator and we use a calibrated concrete but what it does is it drops that concrete you know it it takes the any voids out it it drops it okay and so I, I, I'm thinking, okay, so I'm I'm riding down the road eight hours a day or, you know, X in a boat or whatever, you know, that vibration, you know, on my spine, you know, the weight of, you know, well, I mean, we're fluid. We there's some some things in there that, you know, our skeletal system, but you know, if you if you look at the spine and the, you know, the all the different padding that we have in there, you know, it's got to be dropping down or becoming you know, smaller with the same principle of uh, same principle of vibration. Yeah, and with the the seated posture, so that's typically related the whole body as the effect on the the lumbar spine. <laughs> uh, although there can be effects with your you know internal organs, uh, but even with the seated posture, then I would say you're somewhat limited to be able to absorb the vibration. So you're your butt's up against the seat, and when you get a jarring effect, then it's right there by your spine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, and and with that, coming back to the more of the definition or the multifactorial piece, you know, I see more of 
that as an issue, uh, personally in the industries I've worked with, the jarring, the immediate jarring as the issue, not necessarily the, the, you know, the motor or the engine of the machine that's running. Mm -hmm. So as far as transmissions, whole body is typically foot or through the butt. That's uh, generally affecting the back. And then there's also segment, uh, largely the hands as we hold on to things. That can get into your hand arm vibration syndrome, uh, particularly how you hold the object. Uh, are you fighting it? Or are you relaxed and get into some uh, lateral medial epicondylitis type issues? What have y'all seen with the uh, you know transmission of vibration in different body parts? Uh, what type of injuries have you seen? I'll speak to the hand, if you don't mind. Um, you know, if you look at the hand house designed, it, it's primarily a bone with fascia, tendon, blood supply, and a lot of nerves. Mm -hmm. There's more there's more sensory end organs in the tip of your fingers than, than almost the entire body. And so these nerves are very um, susceptible to mechanical stress. There's soft tissue in the body, and they supply about one-third of your brain's capacity. And they have their the underneath them are bone, and bone will resonate vibration very well. Mm -hmm. A lot of research demonstrates the fact that, it, that that vibration will do two big things to the hand. One, it will create or change the force feedback loop. It Absolutely. will go to the organ, which actually will disallow the force feedback loop to occur. And so you'll grip harder than you need to to do that, right. that weed eater. You'll squeeze hard. The reason why is because that goji's been turned off. And so you're squeezing harder you need to to make that happen, to make it occur. And so you're working harder you need to, so you lose the knack or the capacity for force regulation, which is critical for long term work and for avoiding injury. The second thing is if you're dealing with a tool that has vibration and a sharp, a sharp edge, you're going to have a lot of mechanical stress to tissue that's exposed to the, the lack of force regulation. So we see a lot of, of um, trigger finger occur uh, with vibration uh, and sharp edge. We see uh, a lot. Where do you say the Greg? Where do you say the sharp edge? Where does that occur? Is that like a? Uh, uh, they have they have a tool that 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 has a has a sharper edge on it. And it's vibrating, like uh, in a poultry meat yeah, cutting industry. Yeah, it could be okay. that. It could be a, uh, or just a heck. Even I've seen chainsaws that, that you know that have that have sharp edges. They didn't round them off, and that the guys are out there working. Um, so bottom line is it's, it's, it's becomes, and then, then you got a cold environment on top of that. Um, it becomes a, a big issue, but, but the, 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 the hand's ability to absorb vibration is poor because of the, the, the large amount of bone exposure and a minimal amount of muscle and mm -hmm. a lot of nerve. And so it also causes vasoconstriction, which is an autonom autonomic response to, uh, to vibration. And so, um, when you have vasoconstriction, it diminishes oxygen flow. Well, you know, as I said, the nerves, there's, there's, you know, a tremendous amount of nerve endings. There's 30,000 nerve endings per finger and 40,000 in your thumb. Nervous tissue makes up 2% of your body mass and burns, burns 25% of your oxygen. So when you have mm -hmm. basal constriction in a cold environment with vibration, it really shuts down your capacity for your, for your engine, your muscles to work. And so it's, it's, it's the force regulation, the oxygen transport system, Vibration is a, is a very powerful um, and very tough animal to deal with, uh, and it can create a lot of problems for for uh, function and, and and the and the you know, nervous system doesn't doesn't recover as well as what you would with a muscle or other tissue. Right. Exactly. You're That's right. where you get that long term effect. You're right. You know, it takes two days for the nutrition to flow from your neck down to the tip of your fingers. That that gives your end organs nutrition. Now, that's a big deal. If you shut that pathway off with vibration and it goes into vaso vasoconstriction, it's a big, big deal. And so these are one of the, the vibrations, one thing we really try to avoid and try to really engineer out as best we can. That's why I was so excited to, to listen to you talk tonight, because I think this is a big, big deal in terms of long-term injuries to carpal tunnel, trigger finger, cubal tunnel, um, Guyon's canal, uh, those type of things. Um, 
are really, really a big issue as in, in terms of, of, of as it relates to vibration. Anything else as far as trans where or the pathway that the vibration is transmitted that you'd like to add? Full body, foot or butt, uh, hand arm, mainly from your distal extremity. I'll just throw in a, a couple of things. I mean, obviously, most of my experience is, is a little bit outside of the traditional work environment. But when we start talking about whole vibration, whole body vibration and the translation kind of beginning at the foot, Evolutionarily, I think I would make the argument that we've really adapted our bodies to try and damp vibration to ensure that as little as possible of that vibration gets to the base of our skull so that it doesn't interfere with our vision. Uh, okay. Obviously, it, it's super dangerous for us if we can't tell the difference evolutionarily between a stick and a snake or the edge of a cliff uh, and the end of a trail, right? Like those things have major complications. And so you have all this co-contraction that it happens just over the course of the gait cycle from pre-tuning all the way up through uh, dealing with the introduction of that vibration from a soft tissue standpoint. And there's a very different natural resonant frequency between general soft tissue and bone. And so there's this big gap in between the two um, that depending on everything from uh, your general uh, body composition all the way through to uh, how well equipped you are as an individual to deal with that vibration um, that can play a huge impact in the way that that soft tissue responds, that the pre-tuning response occurs, as well as the co-contraction that happens uh, throughout the body in an effort to damp that vibration. Um, and certainly, I, I think vibration is hugely misunderstood uh, and underappreciated for its contribution to fatigue just as we move, um, even if there's not a, a significant external input like there would be from a tool or uh, other external factors um, as well. But it would certainly seem to me that when you're talking about a situation where, especially if you're sitting, you're really taking out one of the primary mechanisms um, that your body would have for dealing with that vibration as if you were walking or moving right. from a whole body vibration standpoint. So you're already at a major disadvantage just from a, a pure input standpoint. Absolutely. Yeah, if, if you don't mind, I, I, I've got lots of questions. So I, I'm trying to, Matt, this one's for you. And I was so excited when you, uh, when you said, yes, you'd be, uh, be a panelist but what from the research on transmission and Keith's basically described a transmission of another type of energy in and and multi-factors but when that's by what what kind of research is being done as far as you know the things that you can do to break that that transmission uh and you know because we walk we transmit it I mean what what do you uh what are you finding yeah, so th there's a couple different things that we've seen in our research, but then also there's a much larger body of, of research on, on vibration relative to the gait cycle. Um, the first thing that, that I would point out is there's um, a, an overlap between the natural uh, resonant frequency of soft tissue and the, the natural uh, frequency that is just created from moving. So when your foot collides with the ground, there's a good overlap in, in those, uh, which is why the vibration is translated so well through the, the lower extremity in particular. But I would say there's also different sensitivities to vibration. So there are some people that um, have a higher sensitivity. So they're, they're going to be able to feel um, lower frequencies uh, and, and higher frequencies, just the range at which they, they are able to perceive those vibrations is different. And so the body's response to that is also tuned differently um, based on your, your kind of natural um, reception to that vibration. Um, and so the, a lot of the research uh, has focused again on kind of the body's response to that. So what is that co-contraction that happens? How much of that vibration is translated? Um, the most common uh, from a biomechanics perspective uh, in the broader literature, the most common things that we would look at, for example, would be different types of compounds and say the midsole of a piece of footwear that's able to, to damp 
some of that um, as soon as you impact the ground so that not as much is translated up. And there's a variety of different material characteristics. We certainly look at that from an insole perspective at Superfeed as well, uh, of ways that we could create a, a damping effect on that. Um, and so there's, there's kind of a wide range of um, opportunities for modulating materials and the composition of materials to have an effect. And then also um, there are things like compression garments that can uh, reduce the ability uh, of just kinematically the ability of that muscle to, to bounce around and, and respond to that, that soft tissue. Um, so those are probably the, the, the most frequent mechanisms that are, that are researched. So as a, you know, we talk about the resonance of organs and the, the effect of vibration, I think the easiest one to really understand is the, is people getting motion sickness or seasick and that your, you know, vestibular has a resonance and when it gets mm -hmm. with those nice little waves that you have on the ocean, when it gets it out of sync, then you don't feel as well. So there can be an effect with the different organs as well, being out of sync with their natural uh, frequencies and how they behave. So let's sure. take a little bit of, let's take a little bit of look at the, the effect. Uh, reading on the back, there seems to be an overlap with the uh, vibration, long-term vibration and the, the lumbar region uh, degenerating. You know the tissues breaking down. I didn't really read the you know anything any formation of like osteophytes or spurs, but overall a general breaking down of tissues. Uh, more on the the hand side from the transmission. Uh, I've seen mechanical tearing of tissues, particularly around the lateral medial epicondylitis, uh, as you grip something. Uh, if you grip it hard, if you're fighting the tool, then that's transmitted just directly into into throughout your arm, and a key component of the being able to hold on to something are your epicondyls or where mm -hmm. the tissues uh, connect in the forearm or in the elbow. And then, as Greg talked about, just the distally the vasoconstrictive deficit, uh, looking at the white finger syndrome or other hand-arm vibration type issues. So what are your thoughts? Go ahead, Steve. I'm sorry. I, you know, that I'm, I'm intrigued by white finger and we were, again, I was having a conversation with somebody about what's the mechanism. Uh, and I guess I'm pointing this at Greg and, and you both, but Greg, what happens in the hand when white finger, you know, it's common term, but what's really going on? What's really going on is that the hand uh, has had an adverse reaction and the autonomic nervous system has shut down to see so you have a vasoconstriction that occurs. And so it stops the, the blood flow in, which the oxygenated blood in, which turns the finger white. It's the mm -hmm. same, same phenomenon as Raynaud syndrome has the same effect. And so um, I've got a good buddy of mine that's a doctor here in town and and I, we can be, we could be at, at the kitchen table and, and just turn on some cold water. He would say, and it just turns like snow white and he has this. So he's, yeah. so some of it's ge is genetically based. He has a predisposition for vasoconstriction, but, uh, if we go out like shooting pistols or whatever, he has the same problem. And from that vibration from the weapon, as it's really mm -hmm. interesting to look at. And so, um, I think there's partially a genetic component to it, but, also a an environmental and slash uh, exposure to risk factors component to it, uh, but but bottom line line it's the it's the, it's the nervous system that controls blood flow, nail growth, hair growth, sweat, and skin integrity. The autonomic nervous system uh, has uh, a, a an adverse hyperactive response to stress. It could be a cold environment, it could be vibration, but it has a very quick response or hyperactive response to that stimulus. Yeah, kind of simple terms. I like to relate it to you know, as you're you're starving that nerve, yep. it, it can't get the nutrients that it needs to function. Mm -hmm. And some are uh, the starvation occurs quicker in some than others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, 
then I can ask another question. <laughs> <laughs> now, what is so if I'm telling somebody at work and they're running a weed eater, they're running a vibratory piece of equipment, what is the earliest signs and symptoms? Because the 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 best thing I've ever done in the program is is uh, is to teach people, you know, here's early signs and symptoms. You get a lot more reports, and the the severity goes down. What what do you tell people to uh, to be looking for? I think you hit it from the start. You know, if when you let go of it, if your hands are still feeling it, <laughs> that's the right. first sign. You yeah. know, something's something's starting. Yeah. Uh, you know, listen, your body tells you a lot of things if you're going to listen. Right. Uh, others, you know, as Greg alluded to with the uh, with his colleague, you know, he gets a visual indicator. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things, and Greg related it a little bit, is uh, when I work with people with tools, you know, that if you can see your fingertips turn white as you grasp that tool, we probably need to work on your technique. Because that's kind of a, you know, it's kind of like the start of it, is is that you're you're cutting off the ability, you know, even with that pressure, to get the nutrients to different tissues. So true. Develop the NAC. Yeah. The NAC. The Japanese call it the NAC. The NAC. The NAC. Yeah, it's amazing how. Uh, watching workers working with them they have a it's an art seeing them uh make cuts and meat being able to use different tools it's an art you know even the running the jackhammer it's amazing how some people are just fluid with it yep. and then that relates to the at the top of you know technique is that one of the ways that we can address it well looking at addressing it and then uh, there are different ways to measure. Hmm. Uh, I look at really two. Uh, you know, the measurement really occurs with an accelerometer. You apply a device to the object and you right. understand what the output is. Uh, I like to, when I purchase a tool uh, for employers, is I want the vendor to tell me what the characteristics are. You know, I'd like to know that they've done the studies and they're part of the solution to help not have somebody be fatigued, not be injured, and help them tell me, have them tell me what we need to be doing. Or you can measure it yourself. Uh, I don't think it's a simple measure, uh, but it can be done, or you can contract that out for somebody to do it if you have the, if you have the need to really understand the exact output. Mm -hmm. Albert, would you like to expand on that a little bit more? Yeah, I've had to do that a lot with, and it's it's it is tedious, as you say, when you have to do the triaxial things to to figure out where it's all going, and and from my experience with uh, a lot of research settings is that people transition the focus for vibration not to how it could be damaging the person but how it is interfering with the experimental measurements and how you can control what is this device doing in terms of the quality and checking checking on those things. Um, one of the things we, we, we hear very commonly today is about the quantum computers, how sensitive they are to the vibrations and how that, that, yeah. that, that everything has to be dampened and really cold and how damaging that is. And, um, it's kind of disappointing that we have such a, a machine focus on the quality output of what, what, what vibration can do to product quality that yeah. we somehow miss that, oh, those things can also impact people that are trying to manipulate those things. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that people, as, they, as they're listening to this, that realize that yeah, vibration control is critical for quality output and, and productivity from that sense, but what are we, are we taking those same, that same care and determining what the equipment is that's doing the vibrations that are doing to our bodies? What do we know about those? How are we controlling that? Yeah, and that's where I really like to have the interaction with the vendor 
and try to understand if they've done the research to understand their own equipment and can help me through, you know, a, a best purchase, if you will. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's look a little bit about, you've got vibration. At what point would you really, Albert, would you really suggest that we need to measure? I Well, I think, um, well, unfortunately, in, in today's uh, war-torn world, it's like um, uh, vibration is uh, an excellent weapon to incapacitate people. Our military is quite yeah. active on that. It's like I have a background here in my slide. You may be able to see it, that there's certain frequencies that if you blast people with, you're, you're simply going to incapacitate them, uh, make them very sick or weak, uh, and, and, and those types of things. So, so that can be um, a potent use of vibration in, in that sense, that you can intentionally inflict on people for, for uh, control. Yeah, and that's not what the uh, the Eagles have been doing, right? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't work so well this last weekend, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, when would you suggest, though, that you know a company really start to measure to get a get a numeric around the vibrations, you know, particularly if you're in a uh, an industry where you're using grinders and chippers and things like that. Hmm. You know, for me, I like to keep it fairly simple, uh, as, as Steve alluded to, and, and Matt, you know, at the fatigue point, that's when we start to lose efficiency productivity. Right. So that's really where, uh, where I would rather, rather take it up. Uh, I think it is important at some point to understand the measures so that we can have better, uh, you know, better tools. Uh, but on the reduction that I have here in the notes, you know, is it possible to take the human out of a vibration uh, cycle? Can you design it out with a different process? You know, are you able to use a, a robot perhaps that could absorb it better? Uh, something that really just takes the the person out of the loop uh, mm -hmm. when i get asked you know from companies of how do you eliminate uh, lifting injuries it's really pretty simple and that's stop lifting stuff <laughs> <laughs> how do you wrong. get there that how do you get there you, you, that that treat keith that is so true that is that is <laughs> That is so true. So around vibration, you know, is there a way to do it without the, if it's egregious, how can we take the, the human out of it? Mm -hmm. Let something else, uh, something else absorb that forces, those forces. Uh, yeah. Steve? Well, I was going to say, yeah, and, and you, you actually nailed it earlier too, is, you know, the things that you can't, I mean, there's things right now that, that you can't, uh, engineer out or you you know w one of the things that that the best companies do is they put together a standardization list so they go they find the best product which has the least amount of of uh, risk factor built into it you know there's companies that have done some good things but a lot of times if you think you're saving fifty dollars on a tool you know you uh you you don't understand the you know what's at risk so you know to have a good standardization list and go through and say i want you know we're going to buy this jackhammer we're going to buy this you know things that the tool itself's been engineered um that i i found that to be make people's lives a lot easier you know, uh, so yeah so now you're com you're, you're combining the uh purchase or acquisition phase with the tool and getting the leadership buy-in on right. you know, long term, this is a really a better uh, better product for us to use. You know, and so some of that feeds into can you dampen the effect of the vibration at the tool? In other words, the tool is going to vibrate, but can you have the tool take care of it? Yeah. Uh, my example is you know just shooting a screw, fastened metal. 
uh, at the end, there's going to be some reactionary torque whenever that screw stops turning. Uh, some tools will uh, have a clutch that will take out that vibration or minimize it drastically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, look at many operations where you have a awkward posture and particularly with that uh, reactionary torque, the chances of a carpal tunnel really goes up because you're already in a constrained posture, uh, at-risk posture with an at-risk tool. Keith, what, what percentage of tools have that capacity in them? And is, is it primarily a, uh, like a, a price point feature or is it, where does it come into play in, in those relevant tools? No, don't really understand the question. <laughs> well, I you're, have you're a, talking about there, there's a, a mechanism, right? That sir. can help create a damping effect on, especially the, I think you used the fastening a screw at the, at the end of that, that, that yeah, you get that little a significant amount of torque at the end. So I was saying, you, you said that there's a certain percentage. I said, do you, do you know what, is there a percentage that you're aware I know, of? Uh, I know of some companies that have done considerable research on it. They publish the vibration characteristics of their tools. Uh, I really like to recommend them. Yeah, it's, it really comes down to trust. You know, they're telling me uh, what, what to look out for and what they've done about it. You know, and they have publications. Uh, one in particular has publications around it. Uh, some of the other tool manufacturers uh, may not, uh, but I like to have, you know, that conversation with the vendor on, you know, just start out, what does ergonomics mean to you guys? Or even simpler, you know, can you spell ergonomics and go from there? <laughs> but, uh, but there are some manufacturers that have paid attention and can provide uh, tools that decrease that transmission to the person. And I think that's one of the key things to think about is the is to divide this into three components. So you have this source, and you have the path, and you have the receiver, and you're able to intervene in all three of these areas. And sometimes you really need to layer your controls to make sure that you're you're minimizing what actually happens to the person. Um, and this is like especially true for like when you're trying to do reduce vibrations that impact the ear from, from noise, for instance. But you can do this for the the concept works for all the other things. Yeah. I you know, so with these discussions, I learned just as much as uh more so than probably anybody else. That's a good way to put it, looking at the source path and receiver and working to affect break it down. Uh, make an effect or intervention in any one of those. And you can, you also, I think you can make firm links to the, the lean perspective is that all of that vibration energy is just wasted if it's in excess of what it needs to do to trim the material or smooth the material or, or do something like that. It's like, how can you actually minimize what you need to get the job done? Well, that, that's you need to detune it. Yeah, that's really uh, looking at really some of the environmental sustainability and energy reduction. Uh, even on the pneumatic side, large effort to reduce how much compressed air you're creating and using. So, yeah, the getting it dialed in and just right can have an impact on your expenses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, dampening the effect uh, to the user, you know, so we've talked a little bit about pads, uh, vibration gloves, anti-vibration gloves, you know, in essence, it's almost your last stop. You know, something is uh, touching the person and you're trying to abate that vibration before, just before it gets to the person or as I related to the receiver. Uh, I've had, go ahead. 
I was just going to say that um, we, we we see a lot of people, we try to get back to work and they have hypersensitive problems. They have nervous tissue that's been damaged, uh, crushed, burned, lacerated. Um, and we've had some really good luck with a couple of different products, um, at least to, to get them back into the, back into the environment. Um, one is a product called PPT out of 3M and it's a high density foam. I do a little party trick with it. I actually wrap my finger around just one layer of it, take a hammer, hit it. And it, it totally dissipates the force. <laughs> pretty, pretty cool, uh, pretty cool party trick with it, but, but it really does work. Um, and the other one is silicon and silicon now comes in different forms and we actually use it like for digital nerve injuries. Um, that they're very hypersensitive that the, the digital, digital nerve is, and you can, and this silicon comes in a, in a, like a tube, like a, it's called digi tube. It goes around the finger. It's, it totally, this, this product is totally impregnated all the way around 360 with silicon. And so it really takes the edge off of, uh, power tools, uh, and vibration to let that patient, you know, enter back into the workforce, uh, because everything bothers them. So it really does. It really, and it goes right underneath gloves. Uh, it's easy to use. It's it's not super expensive, but those are just some some things that we have found to be very useful for getting injured workers back into the workforce that has to deal with some vibration exposure because of hypersensitivity. And, and I've had greater success with providing matting instead of a, a glove type material. You know, I think it was stated earlier. You know, you have with the uh, the hand arm vibration, and that through that cycle you start to lose sensitivity, and as you lose sensitivity, then you start to grip more. Mm -hmm. So then you're increasing your expenditure. Yep. Uh, a lot of the gloves, you know, you you just start out with not being able to feel what you're doing, so it, it's it sometimes seems to be a counter effective technique where or provision that yeah you may be you may be reducing the vibration but the person is having to increase their grip force because they can't feel it feel the object through the just the density of the of the glove mm -hmm. and i think some of that can go back to like uh in the in the trades when you have a, apprentices coming along in that um some of these things are just replicated and there are newer ways of doing it. But uh, some of the research has indicated that some of the, the uh, apprentices would be reluctant to use the methods because the senior people are, are trained to do it this the, another way. And they are experts at doing that and have high quality and they don't necessarily understand how to incorporate these safer methods. And so that that training is is om omitted or or is not as prominent as it should be. Yeah, I had used a <laughs> one of the uh, silicon materials and uh, introduced it, and really had two groups. The older group, you know, basically said they had never used it, and then started out new employees with it. And it was it was pretty funny that both groups were steadfast, solid in in, in bipolar in the effect of it. Hmm. Well, train. We talked a little bit about training. Uh, it's critical. How do you get there? You know, can you identify your your best users? Those that have a high efficiency, high quality output. Uh, use those guys to train the newer guys that uh, may not have the technique. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mentioned here rotation. Uh, I know that's very difficult. Uh, I know one of the leading reasons not to rotate is just the skill sets that people tend to need uh, to be able to make a rotation pattern truly effective. Uh, but it can help if we can measure, understand that uh, perhaps a safe factor is only two hours a day, then can we get to no more than two hours of exposure within a time period or whatever that time period would be. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, before we talked about 
you know, vibration is multifactorial. Uh, can you get to a combination of techniques to help reduce the, the effect anywhere along the path around the, the source, the path, or the receiver? Ray, I see we have about three minutes left. Uh, you know, in refreshing on some of the material, I thought it was really interesting that that whole body vibration is being promoted as a almost as an exercise means and in a way to improve. Uh, to me, it's like uh, I live here in Texas, so we have bluebell ice cream. A little bit, it's okay, but too much isn't. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I thought it, you know, it was really interesting to see that there can be a benefit to it, uh, but we have to be, you know, specific on its application. Uh, you know, careful with how much. Yeah, I've seen one of those uh, vibrating like dumbbells where you hold out and they kind of shake. I think they're called <laughs> weights. Maybe. Yeah, most of what I saw was a, you know, a standing pad, a standing vibrating pad that. Oh yes. Yeah, when, when you think about it, yeah, you, your body has to adjust and it has to have those contractions. Uh, I just thought it was really interesting that that which seemed to be a problem, you know, in some spheres can be a benefit. Yeah, one of the one of the things I know we're running short on time, but uh, I, I do have a couple more. Uh, questions is uh you know one of the one of the drums i beat frequently is aging workforce and it's on us it's we don't have to wait to see what we're talking about uh greg keith anybody albert uh tell us uh g give me a little bit of information on what you see from uh our bodies wearing out and how you know from a vibration effect on an older population like me <laughs> first every employee is important particularly these days mm -hmm. uh, as we as we get older then those personal factors increase and i think we, just, <clears throat> we really need to be more cognizant of that group you know mm -hmm. and how do we protect that group you know not uncommon to have you know those with a a back issue driving a fork truck and being very overweight mm -hmm. all of the older less flow less the nutrients throughout the body other damages so your risk is even higher mm -hmm. and those are a lot of, a lot of times the injuries i see are to the with this is to the older group mm -hmm. you know so do we need to is there a way to if you can't do any of the other reductions is there a way that they could you know, reduce, we still need their contribution, but can they do it in a, is it acceptable to do it in a more limited fashion? You know, could they be in the rotation cycle for only an hour? Mm -hmm. Still contribute, but maybe somebody else a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to me, the take home message is not to give up, but to really try to deconstruct things and accept that there are are all these things that interact. And if you can reduce part of some of the exposure, then you're you're making progress. It's not all or nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And not to back up just a little bit, I'm I'm actually a proponent of PPE. And uh, you know, I think that the places that uh, you know, a jackhammer is technically run by gravity, you know, and a, a good jackhammer operator, usually you see them running it with one hand, you don't yeah. see the people laying on it. But as a, uh, you know, I use, I recommend in all my JHAs, JSAs, uh, I'll, I recommend anti-vibratory gloves for certain. And, uh, and the people that have had experience with no gloves or just a pair of regular gloves, as opposed to uh, anti-vibratory gloves you don't have to show them at one time uh they uh number one they're grateful um i have a pair that i use on uh on my weed eater at home so i think that uh and then with you know when when we look at uh i i as a disclaimer we we make no money off super feet if you buy them you we don't make any money it, it, you know but I'm a huge proponent and uh, 
I think that from that postural perspective, you know, to get my body in alignment, feet first, and then, you know, everything coming up, um, you know, I, I personally receive huge benefits. I see people that do that. And then when you add a, if it's a standing posture, you know, if it's, if they're in one position, uh, that anti-fatigue mat, which is a miss, you know, it, it is kind of a, but that transmission of of energy plus our our uh muscles or we have to have the contractions in our muscles for the for the blood to recirculate so you know we're talking about you know the oxygen uh you know that's what an anti-fatigue mat's for is it's to get your blood to you know you see those 10 people standing up in in a wedding and funniest videos and somebody <laughs> faints well they're, they're they have blood pooling you know and 22 percent oxygen went down and you know they're getting a constant stream of so I, the, personally, the, the things that I've seen work the best are a systems approach, you know, lower extremity systems, knee pads, you know, when you're looking at all these different risk factors and, but, uh, and Greg beats the drum all the time, you know, it's uh, posture is such a, you know, huge contributing factor. Uh, and, you know, those are the, those are the things that, that I see today, you know, and, and to be able to help people and education actually is the, is the thing that causes the most change. And that's one thing I know we're short on time, but I would just really urge the, the, the people in the, 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 the practitioners out there and the supervisors, managers is to just start actually asking people, how do they feel when they're using this tool? And, and start doing more active surveillance on things because you might be surprised at how frequent these issues are and people are just, are just like saying, oh, well, this is just what I expect. And it's like, no, that may not be the case. You may not have to put up with that. There could be other options that are low cost to do uh, to, to, to solve your problem. But just ask people, how are they feeling? Yeah. I think one of the biggest impacts that, in my my opinion, that that um, vibration it, it mainly impacts for me when I see my clients. It impacts the fatigue factor because you work over. When you work over, you you, you develop your posture goes away, and you get then then the awkward posture set, and it's just a snowball rolling downhill. And vibration is maybe the biggest contributor, in my opinion, for that. And so that's, that's really, I really like the way, um, uh, Dr. White broke this down. It's very, very nice. Um, he is a master of taking complex things and, and simplifying them. It's called Occam's razor. <laughs> uh, remember the first time I met Keith was 2021. I'm sorry, 2001. And, um, we were at an ergonomics, um, teaching uh, event at East EKU. And I learned more from Keith that day than I'd learned in all the other years I've been practicing. And so uh, Keith is a is a master at taking complex things and making them usable and and really helping people understand complex situations. So um, it's great to see you, Keith. Thank you very much. Yeah. Good to see you too, Greg. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And you know what? I want to, if you don't mind, let me jump in here real quick. I want to thank all of our panelists. You all, uh, you've done an amazing job. Uh, we got a question here or uh, we have something from uh, from one of our participants. Let me click on that. Ray, you want to read yep, it? I got it. Uh, why is the ANSI standard on vibration not followed or looked at ser as seriously as other uh, ANSI standards, or why is vibration not being used in most hazard assessments? I think it's largely not well understood. So, you know, part, part of this is to get the message out there. Yeah. And, you know, let's look at it. Uh, there is an impact. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have to isolate it to the exact measure? Uh, sometimes maybe, uh, but I think, you know, looking at our efficiency decrease, once you start to fatigue, can you get ahead of that and understand from your asking the person, how are they doing? Uh, probably the best way to go. But then again, 
Uh, we need to be engaging, uh, you know, as I talk about it, uh, at risk, I want to stop the risk at the source. Mm -hmm. You know, if we have great tools that aren't producing the detrimental vibrations, we're all winning. You know, mm -hmm. Then we don't have to worry about a lot of the other stuff. So can we have those conversations? And it takes a lot. Getting the vendor together, getting the managers to buy into it, getting the purchase people to buy into it. Mm -hmm. uh, but this, you know, these discussions are tremendous to get get the conversation going. Definitely, and I think we're slowly kind of turning towards that. Even just looking up my own research, I was looking at the the Walt website, and they were talking about a lot of vibration and how they're coming up with new tools and have a whole ergonomic sector on research and development for these. Yeah, At Atlas Copco is another good one that uh, has some publications around it. Definitely. Well, we can um, uh, pause here, and if nobody else has any more questions, I'm going to turn it over and share my screen real fast. Okay. Do I need to stop to share? Uh, Yeah, if you don't mind, please. Got it. That's a, that's a good looking, good looking screen. Oh, thank you, Ray. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and uh, again, once again, I want to say uh, thanks to everyone, all the panelists, all the attendees. Uh, Dr. White, appreciate you joining us today. And again, that was a great discussion, and we learned a lot. And again, it's important just to keep asking the questions and how we can all learn and kind of be er er um, ergonomous and just try to prevent these injuries and help other industries become better. Yeah. And uh, Steve, I'll let you say the last few words yeah i uh, thank you sir i uh yeah and and what sponsor means uh on this screen is it means these are some of our favorite products and uh it it ended up there for a reason super feats at the top of the list i literally uh before we uh turn turn the mic on keith said i have them in every pair of shoes that i wear well, well so do i and uh so they're uh they're a trusted product uh and we we truly love them uh commonwealth hand therapy greg i mentioned owns a few occupational and uh, physical therapy clinics uh, those that's his brand is commonwealth physical or commonwealth hand therapy um so we uh we're behind that 100 uh, percent uh, our office ergo we developed a platform technology platform that we can conduct the fastest uh, training and the uh, the most efficient evaluation techniques on the on the planet. You put it in your, you go through the training. You put it in your hand. You're conducting evaluations. Uh, Tonic Ergo is actually uh, our um, interview, or it's our podcast, and that that shows up in in several places. We've had a lot of good people that are sharing. Um, and what we really want to do is encourage people to get in the field. That's that's typically what our our answer is about. How'd you get here? And uh, you know, we uh, there's not enough people doing ergonomics. It's the number one problem in in all industries. And uh, ohm seating, uh, ohm seating is a uh, we we love ohm seating. It comes in and open up the box, and there's no assembly required. You put three pieces together, and you're sitting down in your chair and uh, they did an amazing job, and it's a, it's a great company. And then um, I help 360. We work closely with the uh, the founder of this company, uh, and uh, they uh, they they just launched, uh, and they're doing doing great things. So you know, I can't think of anything but but really good things to to say about them. They don't give us money to do it either. It's uh, you know, they're these are all. Some are bigger companies, some are smaller companies, but everybody gets uh, the same chance if we love their products. And um, it's not the love of money. It's the love of preventing people from getting getting hurt. And uh, I'm with you, Greg. I walk, I was in a room with you and Keith White 20, in 2001. And uh, today, a lot of the things come flying out of my mouth are things that, uh, that I heard from Keith White first. And uh, so I can't, but I can't thank you all, all enough. Uh, for sharing and and being part of this and uh, the question about the ANSI, uh, why don't people follow the you know the ANSI standard? And I think the most powerful part of that is is based on lack of education. 
Um, that's what this forum's for is we want people to, to understand the nature of the problem and uh, then then I can do something about it if I know what the if I know what the enemy is. But uh, anyway, this is this has been great. Thank you all so very much. Awesome. Yeah, I just want to thank you, uh, Dr. White, and we can all go ahead and have a good night. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Night.